Saturday the 13th, the conversation again fell upon, as you know, of the considerable fortunes which the emperor had bestowed. That of, as you know, he said, was one of the most extravagant. The sums he had given him almost exceeded belief. And yet he was always in debt. He had squandered treasures without credit to himself, without discernment or taste. And too frequently the emperor added in gross debauchery. He has been seen more than once after having taken a most copious and substantial breakfast in his magnificent hotel at Paris, fired with anger at the most trifling demand made by the most insignificant creditor to threaten to liquidate the debt with his sword. Every time he saw the emperor, said Napoleon, it was to hint its fresh embarrassment. Be reprimanded and assisted. In the campaign of Austerlitz, he came to the emperor at Schoenbrunn. But this time, said Napoleon, it was not to intercede precisely for himself. He took at this period a most lively interest in the beautiful Madame Recamier. He had just arrived from Paris and began his conversation with the emperor by a most virulent philippic against Monsieur de Marbois, then minister of the treasury, who had been base enough, he said, to refuse Monsieur Recamier a loan of only two millions to save him from bankruptcy. All oh, Paris was indignant. This Marbois, he added, was a wicked man, an unworthy servant who did not love the emperor. He, Junot, had gone to him and had used every endeavor to persuade him, but to no purpose. He had represented to him the enormity of his conduct and had assured him. And such added, you know, was a general opinion in Paris that if the emperor had been in the capital, he would have immediately ordered the money to be given to Monsieur Recamier. He was on the wrong scent, said the emperor, for I coolly replied to this passionate lover who was almost out of his senses. You and Paris are both mistaken. I should not have ordered even 2,000 sous to be given, and I should have been very much displeased with Monsieur Marbois if he had acted otherwise than he has done. I am not Madame Recamier's lover, and I do not come forward to the assistance of merchants who keep up an establishment of 600,000 francs per annum. Know that, Mr. Junot, and learn also that the Treasury does not lend money to those whom it knows to have been long since on the road to bankruptcy. It is other claims to satisfy. As you know, Ad the Emperor was obliged to calm his emotion, thinking probably that there were hard hearted people at Vienna as well as at Paris. Junot traveled as fast as the Emperor himself. He had his in relays in Napoleon, hundreds of horses, and other extravagance of the kind. The emperor added that not so much in his capacity as a sovereign, but as being fond of Junot, you know, and actuated also by a sort of feeling derived from the similarity of birthplace, he being also originally from Corsica, he had one day sent for Madame Junot you know, in order to give her some paternal admonitions on the subject of the extravagance of her husband's expenditure, the profusion of diamonds which he, she herself had inconsiderately displayed after her return from Portugal and her intimate connections with a certain foreigner, which might give umbrage in a political point of view. But she rejected this advice, dictated alone by concern for her interest. She grew angry, said the emperor, and treated me like a child. Nothing then remained for me to do but to send her about her business and abandon her to her fate. She fancied herself a princess in the family of the Comines, as you know, had been made to believe it when he was induced to marry her. Her family was from Corsica and resided in the neighborhood of mine. They were under great obligations to my mother, not merely for her benevolence toward Towards them, but for services of a more positive nature, the emperor then gave the following explanation. The Genoese, in evacuating the Marea, had formerly carried a colony of Muniats to Corsica and settled them in the neighborhood of Ajaccio. We soon forget. While he was ambassador to Constantinople, married a Greek woman, and on his return to France, being greatly in favor with Louis XVI, he took it into his head that he must have married a princess. It so happened that some political circumstances occurred to favor his wish. The downfall of Constantinople was believed, and at that moment it would have suited France to advance some pretensions to a portion of that empire. A man of the name of Cumin 
a relation of Madame de Vergennes was therefore sent for from the Greek colony near Iachia, and having been brought to Versailles, was soon after, by virtue of letters patent of Louis XVI, acknowledged a descendant from the emperors of Constantinople. This said Comen was a good farmer whose sister had unexpectedly married some years before a Frenchman, a clerk in the victualling department named P. After the elevation of the family and through the interest of Monsieur de Vergen, this P. clerk in the victualling department had become a man of great consequence, having had the contract for supplying the whole army of Rochambeau, the daughter of the clerk, was this very Madame Junot, Duchess of Rivantes. Junot, in the campaign of Russia, gave me great cause of dissatisfaction, said the emperor. He was no longer the same man, and committed some great errors, which caused us dear. After the return from Moscow, Junot, in consequence of the dissatisfaction he had given, lost the governorship of Paris, and the emperor sent him to Venice. However, that species of disgrace was almost immediately softened by his appointment as governor general of Illyria, but the blow was struck. The frequent incoherences which had been observed in Juno's behavior for some time past, and which had arisen from the excesses in which he had indulged, broke out at last into complete insanity. They were obliged to seize him and convey him home to his paternal mansion, where he died miserably shortly after having mutilated his person with his own hands. Sunday the 14th, during the Dinner, speaking of dress, it was said that amongst the number of great personages at that time, none had carried the ridicule in that point further than Mira. And yet, someone observed his dress was, for the most part, so singular and fantastic that the public called him King Franconi, director of a theater at Paris. The emperor laughed very heartily and confessed that certain costumes and manners sometimes gave to Mira the appearance of a quack operator or a mountebank. It was added that Bernadette also took infinite pains with his dress and that Land bestowed much time upon his. The emperor expressed himself much surprised at what he heard respecting the two latter, and this led him to repeat how sincerely he regretted the loss of Marshall Land. Poor Land, said he had passed the night which preceded the battle in Vienna, and not alone. He appeared on the field without having taken any food and fought the whole day. The physician said that this triple concurrence of circumstances caused his death. He required a great deal of strength after the wound to enable him to bear it, and unfortunately nature was almost exhausted before. It is generally said the emperor observed that there are certain wounds to which death seemed preferable, but this is very seldom the case, I assure you. It is at the moment we are going to part with existence that we cling to it with all our might. Land, the most courageous of men, deprived of both his legs, would not hear of death, and was irritated to that degree that he declared that the two surgeons who attended him deserved to be hanged for behaving so brutally towards a marshal. He had unfortunately overheard them whisper to each other as they thought, without being heard, that it was impossible he could escape. Every moment the unfortunate lad called for the emperor. He twined himself round me, said Napoleon. With all he had left of life, he would hear of no one but me. He thought but of me. It was a kind of instinct. Undoubtedly, he loved his wife and children better than me, yet he did not speak of them. It was he that protected them, whilst I, on the contrary, was his protector. I was for him something vague and undefined, a superior being his providence, which he implored. Somebody then observed that the world had spoken very differently on the subject, that it had been reported that Lan had died like a maniac, vociferating imprecations against the emperor at whom he seemed enraged. And it was added that he had had always an aversion to the emperor and had often manifested it to him with insolence. What an absurdity, said the emperor. Len, on the contrary, adored me. He was assuredly one of the men on whom I could most implicitly rely. It is very true that in the impetuosity of his disposition, he has sometimes suffered some hasty expressions against me to escape his lips, but he would probably have broken the head of any person who had chance to hear them. Returning to Miraz, someone observed that he had greatly influenced the unfortunate events of 1814. He determined them, said the emperor. He is one of the principal causes of our being here, but the fault is originally mine. There were several men whom I had made too great. I had raised them above the sphere of their intelligence. I was reading some days 
since his proclamation on abandoning the Viceroy, which I had not seen before. It is difficult to conceive anything disgraced by a greater degree of turpitude. He says in that document that the moment has come to choose between two banners, that of crime or that of virtue. It is my banner, which he calls the banner of crime. And it is Mira, my creature, the husband of my sister, the man who owed everything to me, who would have been nothing without me, who exists by me, and is known through me alone. It is Mira who writes this. It is impossible to desert the cause of misfortune with more unfeeling brutality and run with more unblushing baseness to hail a new destiny. From that moment, Madame, Mother of the Emperor, refused to have anything more to do with either Mira or his wife. To all their entreaties, she invariably answered that she held traitors and treachery in abhorrence. As soon as she was in Rome after the disasters of 1814, Mira hastened to send her eight magnificent horses out of his stables at Naples, but Madame would not accept them. She resisted in like manner every effort of her daughter Caroline, who constantly repeated that after all, the fault was not hers, that she had no share in it. But she could not command her husband. But Madame answered like Clytemnestra, if you could not command him, you ought at least to have opposed him. But what struggles have you made? What blood has flowed at the expense of your own life? You ought to have defended your brother, your benefactor, your master against the sanguinary attempts of your husband. On my return from Elba, said the Emperor, Murat's head was turning on hearing that I had landed in France. The first intelligence he received of this event informed him that I was at Lyon. He was accustomed to my great returns of fortune. He had more than once seen me placed in most extraordinary circumstances. On this occasion, he thought me already master of all Europe and determined to endeavor to wrest Italy from me. For that was his object, the aim of all his hopes. It was in vain that some men of the greatest influence among the nations, which he attempted to excite to rebellion, threw themselves at his feet and assured him that he was mistaken, that the Italians had a king on whom alone they had bestowed their love and their esteem. Nothing could stop him. He lost himself and contributed to lose us a second time. For Austria, supposing that he was acting at my instigation, would not believe my professions and mistrusted me. Murat's unfortunate and corresponds with his conduct. Murat was endowed with extraordinary courage and little intelligence. The too great disproportion between those two qualifications explains the man entirely. It was difficult, if and impossible, to be more courageous than Murat and Land. But Murat had remained courageous and nothing more. The mind of Land, on the contrary, had risen to the level of his courage. He had become a giant. However, said the Emperor in ending the conversation, the execution of Murat is nevertheless horrible. It is an event in the history of the morals of Europe, an infraction of the rules of public decorum. A king has caused another king, acknowledged by all the others, to be shot. What a spell he has broken! The summary of the three months of April, May, and June. I have already observed that in a work like the present, it is impossible to keep up in any point a unity of interest and of object. I shall therefore now attempt to supply this defect by retracing in a very few words and uninterruptedly the circumstances of aggregation which have occurred in the Emperor's situation during these three months, the repeated instances of bad treatment to which he has been subjected, the visible decline of his health, the general tenor of his habits, the principal topics of his conversation, in a word, the bulletin, both physical and moral, of his person during that short space of time. First, a new governor arrives who turns out to be a man of either very narrow views or very bad intentions, a corporal with his watchword instead of a general with his instructions. Secondly, a declaration is required from every one of the captains that he submits beforehand to all the restrictions that may be imposed on Napoleon, and this in the hopes of detaching them from his person. Thirdly, an official communication is made to us of the convention of the allied sovereigns, who without further ceremony proclaim and consecrate the banishment of Napoleon 
Fourthly, we receive the bill of the British Parliament, which converts into a law the act of oppression of the English ministers towards the person of Napoleon. Fifthly, lastly, commissioners come in the name of their sovereigns to watch over the fetters and contemplate the sufferings of the victim. Thus, our horizon grows darker and darker. Our chains are shortened. All hopes of amelioration vanish, and the most gloomy prospects are all that the future presents. The arrival of the new governor is the signal for the infliction of greater hardships. For the person of the emperor, it is the commencement of a new series of torments. Every day he is wounded by the recurrence of some petty vexation. The first step of Sir Hudson Lowe is an insult. His first word, one of cruelty, one of his first acts, an act of hu inhumanity. After that, he seems to have no other occupation, to have received no other instructions than to torment us like a demon and make us suffer under every shape on every occasion and in every way the emperor who at it first resolved to adopt a system of strict stoicism is nevertheless moved with indignation at this conduct and expresses himself in strong terms conversations grow warm the breach is made it will grow wider every day the emperor's health is visibly affected and we can observe a rapid alteration contrary to his natural temperament he very frequently feels indisposed on one occasion he is confined to his room for six days running without going out in the least a secret melancholy which endeavors to conceal itself from every eye and perhaps from his own begins to take possession of him the latent seeds of disease appear ready to be lurking in his system he contracts every day the circle already so confined of his movements and his diversions he gives up riding on horseback he no longer invites any englishman to dinner he even abandons his daily occupations the dictations in which he had hitherto to seem to take pleasure or to stand disgust had seized him he would sometimes say Say to me and he could not muster courage enough to resume them the greater part of his days is passed in turning over some books in his own apartment or in conversing with us either publicly or in private and in the evening after his dinner he reads to us some plays of our great poets or any other work which chance or the choice of the moment brings to his hand yet the serenity of his mind the equanimity of his disposition towards us are not in the least impaired on the contrary we seem more united like one family he is more ours and we belong more to him his conversations offer a greater degree of confidence effusion and interest he would now often send for me in his room to converse with him and these private conversations would sometimes lead him to subjects of great importance such as the war in Russia, that of Spain, the conferences at Tilsit or Erfurt, which will be found at that period in my memoirs. And I must here make or repeat some observations, which I beg my readers will not lose sight of throughout this work, as they will serve to anticipate any reproaches or objections that might be suggested by the want of order, the scantiness, and the imperfection observable in the relation of objects of so much importance. The fact is, if I have not already said it, that when conversing with the emperor either publicly or in private i have never taken the liberty of making any observation or of asking any explanation even when they have appeared to me to be the most necessary and this reserve i consider to be imposed upon me first by respect and decorum second by the fear of interrupting conversations always interesting and important third by the hope of seizing truth as it were on its passage and thus catching its expression more naturally forth by the persuasion which I entertain that I was henceforward resident and forever near the person of the emperor and the certainty which I derive from this circumstance of hearing the same things again repeated in course of time which would afford me opportunities of rendering them more exact and complete fifth because the emperor himself was some day to have seen my journal and I felt assured that encouraged by what he would already find in its pages on those various points he would make them the subject of regular dictations but unfortunately i have been deprived of this advantage and what information have we not lost thereby six lastly and this has been one of my principal reasons because the emperor being sometimes led in the course of a long and quite familiar conversation to touch upon subjects of the highest importance did not relate them with a view to inform me but most frequently merely to kill time or for the sake of talking and it might be added a uh, tautology if such an expression could be used when applied to such a person and such objects. He conversed with me on those topics as if I ought to have been as familiar with them 
as he was himself, but I was a total stranger to these vast plans and these high conceptions. The circumstance, however, which I have convinced myself to have been also common to many of those who at the time of his power were nearest to his person, aye, even to his ministers. It is therefore frequently, it has happened for him to say I'm proceeding to a considerable degree of surprise which the expression of my countenance betrayed, or perhaps on suddenly recollecting himself and knowing the state of the case. But perhaps this is new to you, to which the best reply I could make in order to be true was, yes, sir, it is, and for the most part, new altogether. How could I then, on occasions of such inestimable value, go and awkwardly interrupt him to inform him that I found it difficult to follow him or to understand him? By so doing, I should most assuredly have displeased him and rendered him unwilling to speak for the future, which would have been a great loss to me. I therefore let him go on. However, I might sometimes wish for an explanation and Whatever I could collect in this first conversation appeared to me already of infinite value. I was aware that the emperor was in the habit of frequently repeating the same things, and I flattered myself that I should learn more on other occasions, and that I should thus become sufficiently master of the subject to be able at some future period to take the liberty of discussing it a little with him at liberty, which his goodness towards me during the latter part of the time I was with him would have condescended to allow me, and which would ever, I am sure, sure have been agreeable to him as it would have awakened his ideas and supplied new element to his conversation. But unfortunately, my sudden and unexpected removal from his person has only left me the materials which I had collected up to that moment and to the sorrow which I feel at having been torn from the exercise of those pious cares which had become the source of my happiness will be now added eternal regret at having perhaps by my too great reserve, lust for history and opportunity, which can never occur again. I have been desirous of entering rather minutely into the above particulars in order that it might be understood in what manner I have obtained a portion of these memoirs and that every reader might answer to himself why objects of such paramount importance have been presented in so imperfect a state. However, if the future historian does not find in these pages the light which he seeks for and which he might expect to find, frequent sparks will, however, arrest his attention and invariably lead him into the right path. And from this particular particular circumstance, I shall characterize my own work by saying that it contains something of everything and yet nothing, that there is nothing and yet everything in it, but in saying that there is nothing in it, I am assuredly mistaken, for it contains innumerable traits of the individual qualifications, the natural dispositions, the heart and the mind of the extraordinary being to whom it is consecrated, so that it will be henceforth impossible for any man of unprejudiced mind who seeks honestly for the truth not to be able to fix his opinion upon his character. And I beg the reader to recollect that such has been the only object I have had in view, the only one I have professed to fulfill.